Uh, in a nutshell, uh, Andy was, uh, he's a former reporter for the New York Times. He was out in the environment, covered the environment for their Metro staff, and then uh, moved, up, moved to the science staff. He left the staff of the Times in 2010 to go to Pace University, uh, where he is now the Senior Fellow for Environmental Understanding at Pace University's Pace Academy for Applied Environmental Studies, which is quite a mouthful. Um, when he was at the Times, he started the Dot Earth blog. He continues to write the Dot Earth blog for the Times op-ed section. Uh, and just uh, this week, or within the last couple of weeks, he became one of the featured bloggers for a new blog started by that Pace Academy called uh, Earth Desk. Uh, and it, it, I'm going to read a, a brief excerpt from his first post because it sort of explains what it is that Andy tries to do, and it'll lead into the first question for our discussion. Um, so, so here's the excerpt. He wrote, My move from full-time journalism to Pace University in 2010 was largely aimed at testing and teaching new ways to use communications tools to foster progress on a finite planet. I easily spend more than half of the typical day online. Some might see that as horrifying. Some, sometimes I do, actually. And I don't expect everyone can or should divvy up the scant allotment of hours in a human life this way. But I've become convinced there's huge potential for fast forwarding progress using the growing worldwide web of connections we're developing, from the smartphone to the smart board and beyond. I don't think that blogging or Twitter or Skype or Google Plus on their own will sustain a flourishing if human-dominated planet through our current global growth spurt. But utilized with a better present in mind, these tools can help us share and shape ideas and build and spread knowledge in ways that were impossible just a decade ago. So I'd like to start by asking Andy to, to discuss exactly that, discuss the, the potential for fast-forwarding progress on a global scale, uh, and also then to focus in on the regional scale. Those of us who are working on Long Island Sound issues, um, we have uh, coastal protection to think about, we have hypoxia, we have vast infrastructure problems, we have bacterial problems in our waters. Um, how should we be using those tools to fast forward progress for a better Long Island Sound? Well, thank you for reading that. Uh, boy, that was actually beautifully written, wasn't it? <laughs> Um, I edited it, by the way. <laughs> I guess, you, you know, every, uh, um, the, the great miracle of connectivity that we have now through the web, mostly the web, but also through cell phones, there's now, there's more, almost as many cell phones as people on the planet now. Three quarters of them are in developing countries. Three quarters of those phone subscriptions now are, are not in rich countries, which is amazing. So, you know, there's, for every Long Island Sound, for every Delta region here, there's a Delta region in Myanmar or Bangladesh that's experiencing the same issues. Uh, Jakarta is way ahead of us on sea level rise because it's sinking 10 times faster than sea level is rising because they've been withdrawing so much water from their aquifer. The city, a city of, it must be 15 million people, is sinking 10 times faster than sea level is rising. So, so you think you have issues here? <laughs> Go to a place where you have that much poverty and that little infrastructure yet, which can be a good investment. And you'll see people already grappling with the same questions uh, in, in, in a big way. So, what's the power of communication? Well, it's uh, sh sharing ideas, obviously, you know, whether it's someone on Twitter saying, hey, I'm going to the mall now to, to her friends or his friends, or whether it's um, a match.com kind of thing, a scientist or an engineer who's got a good idea at Purdue University that could help build better buildings in uh, earthquake vulnerable places in um, Turkey. Now you can. You can kind of make sure the idea is getting where it goes, and, and at that light speed, literally. You know, through fiber optics, it's literally light speed. And, and so, if we're not thinking in, in with that in mind, then we're missing huge opportunities to get the right piece of data to the right place at the right time. That's one. And then the other is, is shaping ideas. The first one is just sharing ideas. I, I have an idea. But shaping ideas is, yeah, you have an idea, but it's incomplete. You forgot about this. And what I do in my blogging every day is deal with that. That, that level of, of reactivity and, and mostly constructive, you know, obviously there's a lot of non-constructive reactivity in our lives as well. That gets that amplified on the web. But there's a huge amount of potential constructive and educational and inspiring 
connectivity and, and reaction that's possible as well. So, so it's just I see examples of this frequently, and I try to experiment both in my what I do as a blogger and writer, and in, in the classroom <coughs> as a teacher. And I'm spilling this into other classrooms. I'm working through Pace University with high schools in the region to try, with the science teachers and math teachers to to experiment to talk about ways you can you can work with these tools creatively in the classroom as well. And and, and I. And I, you know, again, there's lots of downside on the web. The noise level is huge, but I think the it, with intentionality, with with motivation, with uh, orientation, and with collaborative um, relationships, you can uh, swamp that stuff in the long run. Because all it takes is one really great idea approved by someone else to become a transformational. And this, and you know, just like. I'll give you one example. He's not here, but Klaus Jacob is another uh, sea level uh, earth scientist, very wise guy who, who's understood a long time ago about the vulnerability here. In uh, Piermont, his house was flooded out in uh, Sandy. But he, in 2003, had gone to the town board or whatever and, and sought to raise his house. He, was, he knew what the real, flood, you know, the real flood map should look like a long time ago. Uh, there's some people in this room from Stevens and elsewhere who also know this stuff. But he, so he sought to elevate his house. And then he ran into something, this may have been discussed here earlier in the day, I only got here mid, mid late morning. Um, he ran into the issue that they have a height restriction in their zoning. So he couldn't raise his house the five feet he, want, he sought to raise it. He rose, raised it as much as he could, literally, without hitting the, the upside limit of, of the height restriction, which was based on you know visibility and, and all that stuff. And then, but he did. He went further. He uh, decided because he couldn't raise his house, he raised his appliances uh, above. They all went upstairs in his house, and so he was the only person in that part of Piermont when Sandy struck, who could, even though his house was damaged and flooded, he could keep doing his laundry and stuff. <laughs> so, and, but but his experience, the idea that his um, that the height restriction was a restriction on plasticity, adaptability to sea level to surge risk is important information. And so rather than that just be a Piermont issue, why not make sure that anyone who has the same questions about how you mesh all our zoning and development and planning um, tools to make sure they're not getting in the way of good sense. I think, you know, sp spill that out. And he, they, uh, Columbia University put a little discussion with them on YouTube. I put it on my blog. And, you know, many thousands of people have experienced it, his learning curve instead of just in that little town. So that's, that's what's out there, I think, is, is great applicability at the local level and through this global connectivity. Um, we could go either of two directions, talking about the adaptations that uh, people like the fellow in Piermont made and what should be done, or communicating about those adaptations. But um, since, since you went that way, uh, what other kinds of things should either local residents or local communities, Long Island Sound, be doing to adapt and to prepare? Well, there's an issue in, in communication that has gotten in the way, I think, of more consensus on the need to wise up on some of these um, perverse incentives that keep us in harm's way and that kind of thing. And this is, um, there was a rush to point to Sandy and make it the specter of global warming such that um, the argument was not just about making your community more resilient, but making sure you're carbon smart and, and zero emissions and all that stuff. All that stuff is important. Changing energy norms is vital. But as I'm sure you heard this morning, and I heard a little bit this morning for sure, the vulnerability is there, period. And the factors, if you look like for the last 40 years in any community right here, and you look at rising sea level versus development patterns, tell me which one has put more people in harm's way. Two inches of sea level rise, or the fact that we've cut quadrupled populations and investments in many floodplains, whether it's inland, you know, like around St. Louis, or or here on the coast. Same thing, and this is not just a coastal issue. Um, wildfire risk in Colorado, same pattern. And in Texas, I wrote several pieces when there were these epic fires in some of these developments um, in Colorado last year. You know, again, the whole discussion was, oh, global warming, global warming, but when you look at what actually happened, what houses burned down in what neighborhoods, almost all those places weren't built 40 years ago, 
the, those communities were built in wilderness, and they were built in areas that the U.S. Fire Forest Service had designated as red zones. <laughs> and so it's like, hello, and, and they, many of them were built with, uh, a, a, with a deduction, a deductible second mortgage. So there's a smart economist out there who said, you know, if you want to have wise policy in an area, you give, like, get rid of the federal deduction for a second mortgage if the house is going to be built in a red zone. I think that's a great idea, but it has nothing to do with global warming, global warming. It's just, you know, so looking, I think you can get more, and that guy who wrote, the economist who wrote that was a libertarian, who I don't think is someone who would readily say, you know, this is all about carbon. And that's why I think it's important to separate those two discussions to, some, to, to a large extent. Vulnerability to hazard, yes. Global warming is one contributor to that in the long run, yes. But making the global warming Making the vulnerability to hazard quite an argument all about global warming, I think, is, is actually counterproductive. So that's something that, that I think is important to discuss. Um, presumably, it would be particularly counterproductive if we had another period where we, we went a number of years with no big storms. Oh, yeah. Well, and this gets into another point. If you get into the climate science, it gets really, really complicated in a hurry. There's a, a guy at NOAA, um, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, uh, a model, a, a, a scientist there named Chun Zhe Wang. After Irene, I did a piece in, in my blog about hurricane risk in a warming world, and they, what he charted in this very rigorous peer-reviewed study was that overall, in recent, in, in the last century, there's been declining landfalls of US, uh, on U.S. coasts of hurricanes. Now he did a new study that I recently um, wrote about, where what's happened in recent decades, there's this, there's this area of the Atlantic, it includes the Caribbean and kind of tropical Atlantic, and it's called the Atlantic Warm Pool. And that area has been expanding, it's, and that's what that's doing, according to his analysis, is driving this kind of, you know, hurricanes form off Africa, they kind of dribble across the Atlantic, and then they sort of recurve north, and some of them, most of them go into the Caribbean. Now, historically, what's happened is when the Atlantic pool gets bigger, that means there's fewer hurricanes hitting U.S. coastlines, but it also means if here's, here's sort of New York, here's Florida, I don't know if that works. Florida. <laughs> <laughs> more, more of those hurricanes that would normally go into the uh, Caribbean are probably going to skirt the coast and come up this way. So again, if you're, you know, if you make this all about global warming, and, you know, if we have to sort of decarbonize for the sake of changes in hurricane patterns, if you have a U.S. approach, a U.S.-centric approach, you'll say, we want global warming, <laughs> because it's taking the hurricanes, most of them are not going to hit the U.S., but it's probably going to increase the hurricane of another sand, at the risk of going another Sandy or Irene. So, uh, you know, it's really ugly. <laughs> right. what, and, the, and the story, the, the lesson there is, if you live in a zone hurt, vulnerable to storm surge, you work on that vulnerability period, you know, right now as much as you can. And in the long cosmic global sense, global warming is something you don't want to continue. The emissions of greenhouse gases are not something you want to continue because of, you're talking about locking in millenniums of sea level rise and uh, a lot of changes to climate patterns that we've gotten used to. But they're separate questions. So then let's talk about public perception. Let me ask you about public perception. A couple of days after Sandy, um, I was in the car, and I was, I was actually driving to someplace out of power because we lost power for 11 days. And you were on with either Brian Lehrer or Linda Lope. And you said something like, um, uh, when people, public opinion surveys and climate change, you, you pointed out that uh, when people were asked about environmental issues, climate change would tend to be out of the other top. But you said, I think this is what you said, the real key will be when climate change starts to appear on lists, not of important environmental issues, um, but of important issues in general. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, uh, any indication that that's happening? No. <laughs> no, it didn't happen. It has never happened, actually. Uh, you know, you get these momentary shifts in public attention to climate. You know, climate matters. So when hurricanes disrupt the, the, the major media capital of the world, you know, when, when, men, when, when Wall Street gets flooded, uh, then people pay attention. But, and when we have epic snowstorms, um, and there's been a lot of analysis as, as these extremes come up, a lot of scientists dig in and say, well, how much of this was global warming and how much wasn't? But in the overall, when you look at these long-term views of what people really care about, 
you don't see much of a shift. And I've just I've compared this, the kind of poll watching that happens on global warming. Oh, people are carrying more. It's like it's water sloshing in a very shallow pan. So I'm carrying a very shallow pan of water, and that means <laughs> that guarantees there's a lot of motion, but the the depth has not changed at all. And the polling that the only polling that really matters, if you want to think that something's becoming politically salient, is is um, what are you worried about right now? When when the pollster doesn't ask you, are you worried about global warming? That's a leading question. That's leading the witness. That happened in a courtroom. Someone would say leading the witness. When when a pollster says, what worries you these days? And it lists five things, and you say the economy, healthcare, whatever you know, crime. It's the environment. Is, is almost never on that list, and and within the environment, climate change is never has not been on that list in decades, and that hasn't changed. So, you know, you can get momentary blips. You know, Mayor Bloomberg said a lot of good things. Cuomo, Cuomo said good things, many of which are about reducing vulnerability uh, with a climate component. But don't expect, I think, anytime soon there to be some final groundswell that will build this into an issue that will prompt uh, President Obama to take it seriously. And there's no sign. To, in my mind that he's taking this seriously despite his rhetoric recently. So then what would be the role of the people who are either in this room or for the organizations that the people in this room are affiliated with in doing a better job communicating the issue? And those organizations would be scientists, government, advocacy groups, the news media? Well, again, I, the first step is to, to separate these issues of vulnerability and climate change into two. Uh, climate change mainly being one about energy use. And, and on that, if you focus on climate smart energy choices are mostly smart energy choices anyway, meaning using less when you have the capacity of the technology and the wisdom to use less energy, that's a great thing financially. I've yet to see anyone say that it's a bad thing to be efficient about resource use. Um, making choices on you know, coal versus natural gas versus renewables, figuring out in a rigorous way what what you can do to move away from coal is really, 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 really important. And this gets to some uncomfortable questions about natural gas. There's some people who just don't want to even have it on the, the list. And nuclear power, which I'm, I'm sure many people, in, there might be divisions here uh, on that. Um, just getting really kind of Digging in on those questions and looking at trajectories for emissions here and, and globally is really important. Starting with what's happening and then really rigorously figuring out well what knobs can you actually tweak here. And, if, and again, the, the power of green space uh, to buffer lands to buffer human, uh, habitated, you know, inhabited landscapes. All those possibilities are there, and most of those make sense anyway. Including the economics in the long haul. If you take away all those pernicious subsidies. On the, this is on the hazard side. And then and the basic education matters. You know, uh, there's these wonderful experiments underway with visualization and education. There's a great, I think it was Danish TV station, it was either Dan Danes or Norwegians, who did a, a very simple graph, graphic, uh, animated graphic, showing the difference between a trend and, and the variability. And it's a guy walking a dog. It's like a, you're looking down on a man, and a cartoon of a man walking a dog. And, on a leash, and the dog is kind of, so the man is walking in this direction, and the dog is like this, you know, like dogs do. <laughs> and, and the camera is, it's got a very simple um, script in which they just say, you know, uh, they discriminate visually, beautifully between variability and, and trend. And it's just so revealing, it's so simple. And it's a way, if you want to talk about climate change, you know, climate change is the long-term trend, the variability Detecting a signal in the variability, including extremes, is, is incredibly hard science. So if you make the argument about hurricanes or about tornadoes in the Midwest, even more so, or about, uh, to a certain extent, less deluges, heavy downpours, there is a there is a trend there, and um, and, on, and heat is, is a strong trend. So so those who are saying, you know, if you're trying to communicate that all weird weather is our is, is now our fault. That's not tenable, and that, that that opens up opportunities for your critics and those who want to do nothing to dive in and say that's an overstatement. So be rigorous, you know, making sure the science is what you think it is. And when you focus on examples, focus on heat more than more than hurricanes. As I said, and if you want to focus on hurricanes, 
just get rigorous about what it is you're talking about. Sea level rise, you know, that the fact that a higher sea level will make any storm surge worse than it would have been is, is a no-brainer. But but not generalizing their, their communication, I think, is very important. Um, there's a lot of gray hair in this room, but you teach at college. Now, are there things going on among the younger generation that makes you think Think stuff might change, or things might get better. <laughs> um, I see some young people. <laughs> so, <laughs> and of course, sixty is only thirty. And all that. Um, you know, I'd like to say there's a sea change, but uh, you know, I'm sure thirty years ago, someone would have said, "Oh, now there's a." You know, we're, we're mostly still largely disengaged on these issues. So getting basic engagement with nature, which is what a lot of you all do, is still the root of getting more care for uh, sustaining the things we care about. And it sounds, you know, very old-fashioned and, and limited to say that, but it's, it's a crucial part, I think, of thinking about curricula. And again, uh, Jeff Main here, other people in this room, my wife, um, myself, what I try to do in my teaching is to just build in elements that guarantees that students who might not otherwise be exposed to things that, that I think matter, this is the great thing you can do as a professor, you must read this book. <laughs> I never realized that until I became an academic. You could actually force people to think that. At any, at any rate, I build into the, to what I, like, I teach a course in documentary production now, and before I joined the course uh, three years ago, Every year, the students on their spring break went somewhere and made a film, which is great. They made a film about the Netherlands ambassador to the United States. They've done films about Tuscany. And, and, um, but since I joined the course, all the films so far, the three we've done, the one of which we're wrapping this today, are about uh, sustainable resource management. One was about shrimp farming. One was about cork forests in Portugal. And, and this one we just finished is about balancing the needs of poor fishermen in Baja, uh, Mexico, with uh, sea turtle conservation. As, and so many of these are students, they're not environmental studies majors, they're not science majors, they're communication majors who will probably never have their job description be about the stuff that we all care about, but they're getting these experiences. You know, they're, they're, they're working with fishermen, taking turtles, sea turtles, they've never seen sea turtles. They never saw a living scallop. There may be people in this room who've never seen a living scallop. How many of you have never seen a live scallop? You gotta see a live scallop before you die. <laughs> I mean, it's a swimming, it's a swimming shellfish, shellfish and it's amazing. They have eyes, they have blue eyes that stare back at you. It's hard to kill a living scallop, um, and they're amazing. So they were seeing living scallops and, and sea turtles and, and, and talking to poor fishermen and villages uh, with a level of poverty that you know they've never experienced. And and so and they go away through, and then they go on into life and become an accountant or a communicator or, or you know or, or a journalist or whatever. But they have a little bit of that that stuff infused in them. So I think the more we can infuse some of that in, in generalists, I think the better off we'll be. And slowly shifting these curves toward uh, progress. Great. Uh, let's take some questions from the floor. We we don't have a wireless mic, so if you have a question, you have to raise your hand and stand up and speak loudly. Mark. Back. Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, it works as well. Even better. Thank you. So uh, I'm interested in the Keystone Pipeline debate, and I'll crudely summarize two arguments and just interested in your response to it. So one side says cars didn't replace horses because there was a shortage of hay. So the one view, and then another side says we've got to cut off the carbon source at the knee at the knees to try to. Quick, more quickly transition to non-carbon sources. What do you see as the, the pros or cons in terms of the, uh, the, the strength of the environmental uh, uh, argument towards shifting toward you know, the ultimate goal of, of uh, using less energy, carbon-based energy? It's, um, unfortunately, it's largely because I'm a middle child and as a blogger, I kind of take on that role. Um, examining arguments on all, all sides and trying to sort of look for overlap. Um, you know, I really like Bill McKibben. He and I have been friends off and on for all the time. We both have been covering global warming. I first wrote about global warming in 1988. He first he wrote his book in, around the same time. And we've diverged in terms of what we see 
are the best paths toward getting some progress. And I'm not going to say he's wrong for chaining himself to the White House along with Jim Hansen and others. Um, we, we live in a landscape where even if, if you talk about the technology in terms of energy and global warming, as Bill says, we need a silver buckshot approach, not a silver bullet. But what I haven't seen from Bill and others in the environmental movement is the willingness to acknowledge that you need a silver buckshot approach also on the social and political side, that you can't, that, that attacking me for, for, for um, not thinking the keystone approach is the best approach, the blocking that pipeline, doesn't acknowledge that there's a lot of directionality in what we're all trying to do on, on oil. I mean, my, my personal thinking is as long as there is a high demand for oil that will keep the price at an inflation adjusted hundred dollars a barrel, roughly where it is now, you turn off that spigot, you turn off that keystone spigot, and we'll just buy more oil from Nigeria. And has anyone here been to Nigeria and see the pollution there? And the social impacts of, of, the, of the, oil, the oil extraction in the Niger Delta? It's unbelievable. It's horrific. And it's actually probably affecting far more people than that sparsely populated part of Alberta. So, so if you're not either out there and you protest at all, you know, I don't see anyone protesting about the oil we're buying from Venezuela or Nigeria. And, or you choose your, you know, you choose your targets. The, you know, Bill and others have, have chosen the political target of Keystone because it puts a lot of leverage on Obama. And, and I thought that was actually a mistake because it, at least in the run-up to the election, because it made him more vulnerable perhaps to losing some liberal votes than, than he might. Now, and again, Obama has been very disappointing to me as well. So. You know, I'm not, so basically it's all necessary. Like, I don't mind having Bill, Bill and Jim Hansen. Bill was very frustrated. He said, Come, I mean, when I first wrote about this, a year, this was the run-up of the election, he was in jail, you know, it was like the letter from the Birmingham jail. Right? <laughs> it was like, you gotta be down here. If you're not down here with me, you're not serious about this issue. And I think that's, that's a failure of the, of the hard green land. I don't know if that makes sense, what I'm trying to play out, play out there, but you need, a reflection, you need to sort of recognize the, the breadth of good intentions. Another question? Over here. If you ask a question, it's your job to bring the mic to the next person. <laughs> think, think seriously about it. <laughs> standards are in flux right now, and, and the new science standards that are emerging do have a section on climate change. Um, what, I, what I think actually, it's not so much about that. Like, you can, you can learn a lot of math, and you can, and depending on how you're learning the math, you could understand the difference between a trend and variation uh, through study, through just basic statistics. You know, if, if we can make sure that when students are learning math, they're learning them. They're having it applied to things like um, uh, uncertainty, the range of uncertainty around uh, sea level rise or, or, um, or um, how warm it's going to get from a double CO2. Without some level of literacy on the basics of statistics, if it, let, let me flip that around to the positive. With more literacy on basic statistics, we could have a much better prospect of what wise decisions by citizens on issues like so so it's, it still comes down not so much to the core and even to like making sure global warming is in there as to making sure that we understand basic concepts another one that one of the most basic concepts that makes the global warming problem a serious one is that it's um it's a um, cumulative problem and this there, there's a, a guy at MIT John Sturman at the Sloan School of Management, who did a study where he took 200 people, really smart people from MIT, who were really good at math, you know what I mean, who have the core down, 
And he, he does like, they, they do a quick primer on climate change, on the nature of CO2, and then they have to draw an emissions curve through the 20th, 21st century that they think would solve the problem, would stabilize concentrations of CO2. And two thirds get it wrong. Because we're so locked behaviorally, if we have a fundamental misunderstanding, it's like credit card debt, which is why we're all, you know, why so many people are in debt. You know, if you just pay debt, if you just pay your monthly, your monthly fee, people think, well, like, oh, I paid off my, you know, this month's uh, debt charge, you know, like that's going to solve their problem, and of course it doesn't. And it's, it's, so there's, the, you know, those basic things, stock flow, stock and flow things, uh, the bathtub effect, which is, again, the same thing, the greenhouse gases are long-lived, so, it's like a filling it. It's filling a bathtub that's draining slower than you're filling it. You know, making sure kids are learning about those basic processes, and I think you have then you'd have more and more wisdom about how big this global warming phenomenon is and where it's leading us if we don't ratchet down the emissions, that kind of thing. It's 1:30, and we're supposed to move back to the theater, but we should take at least one more question. Um, Bob Nixon, and the former life was a journalist in Westchester and Fairfield County, so I um, may have run into Andrew before. But my question is, why is the United States not like Germany, where the conservative government needs to charge on climate change in the EU and in the United Nations and everywhere else? Well, it's not a political issue, it's basically a fundamental issue of their national interest. Um, when is climate change going to be a, a real issue, and not one needs to reside? Issues that they get all the liberals who Actually, want to fuzzy, yeah. but a real economic and social issue that you talked about, fundamental to their national interest, not just really sort of side feel good issue. I'm actually really happy that we're not like Germany. <laughs> Germany is just licensed, they're, they're going to be building new coal fired power plants, uh, a suite of six. We, we're not going to build another coal fired power plant, I don't think, ever in this country. And it's because they're turning off nuclear power. And it's because they don't want to have uh, gas drilling in Germany, so the only thing they have left, and the price in Europe on, on carbon credits has gone so low that it's actually fine and cheap and, success and acceptable for them to build new coal-fired power plants. Because even though they have a lot of uh, uh, solar that they built with a big subsidy, you still need baseload power to back up the solar when the sun's not shining. And they're, so they're going back to coal, and I think that's horrific. So, so actually, there's been a lot of veneer of greenness in parts of Europe that I think doesn't sustain when you look carefully at um, trends on the ground. I think we have to wrap up now. Um, sorry to say, because it's a good conversation. But... <laughs>